Good evening, church. It's good to be with you. It is Wednesday, November the 18th, and we are continuing our studies in the book of Romans. And so if you could take your Bibles now and turn to Romans chapter 13, it's hard to believe we've already gone this far into Romans, and it has meant so much for me to go through it in this manner and to study each chapter and then to link what we previously studied with what we're studying now and it's amazing to see how God speaks through his word and so we're going to ask God to speak again and to teach us through his spirit so let's pray now father as we come to your word again today help us as we seek to understand your truth in our time give us your it's the power of your spirit that overwhelms us and overcomes our, our inabilities to comprehend. And God, I pray that you will speak in a way that changes us, that changes us as individuals, but also as, as your body, the body of Christ. And so lead us now as we read your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so let's start by reading Romans chapter 13. It says, let every person be subject to, to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you should not commit adultery, you should not murder, you should not steal, you should not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand, so let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, but in quarreling and jealousy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. All right, I, I really am enjoying chapter 13 as we go through because I think it's something that is Consistent throughout God's Word, Paul is not teaching some new truth here, but is a continuation of the old. And so what I want to do, as before we even go through chapter 13, I just want to take a look back in Romans and just see some, some truths, some realities of who we are and what, what we've learned. And maybe that also will help us get us to a place where we can receive some of the sometimes one of the harder sayings of Scripture. And so if we think back, and I like to remind us of this, this has like become one of my main um, uh, takeaways from the book of Romans that back in chapter 7, verse 6, but we are to serve in the new way of the Spirit and not the old letter of the law, not the old way of the written code. And so serving in the new way of the Spirit, it's a matter of heart, this is where we get our strength, our power, our security. All of this comes from our faith relationship with God through Christ, and he has put his spirit in us. 
And so we work and we live and we treat one another and we act in the way, in the new way of the Spirit, not the old way of the letter. And that is a way that is by faith. So we go on to, and then in chapter 10, verse 12, I love where Paul reminds us, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so no distinction between Jew and Greek. This comes into being when we begin to look at governing authorities who do not share our common faith in Christ. And just a reminder that in God's eyes that there's no distinction. People are people. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And so we remember that, that when we look at others, we think, oh, that if someone's without Christ, I too was once without Jesus. And so there's no distinction. But also we go on to chapter 11 in, in verses 33 through 36. We see and we have this understanding that God is sovereign. We've got to settle in our hearts and minds that his ways are perfect. So who can understand his ways? Who can know the mind of God? But God is through all and in all. And so we've got to understand that God is more sovereign than we understand. And that helps us as we go into chapter 13. But also chapter 12, verse 1, look at how we behave. So if we're going to serve in this new way of the Spirit, then we see that, that we sacrifice ourselves to God who judges justly. And so what, what really, what can people do to us? If we are to give and present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God, which is holy and acceptable and pleasing to Him, so that we may know His will, then what can people really do to us? I had a friend one time tell me when I was uh, having a hard time in relationships with other people that were very discouraging and, and, uh, and, and it was just this sense that, you know, there were some people that didn't want, that they didn't have my best interest at heart. And a trusted friend of mine, he put it into perspective. He said, they can't kill you if you're already dead. And he meant that if I've already died and I'm in Christ, I've died to myself, if I'm a living sacrifice that's pleasing to God, then there's nothing that anybody can really do to me. And, and that's something that we, we take this renewed mind that we have in Christ and we remember this truth. But also, we go down in, into chapter 12, what we talked about last week, in verses 2 and then 21. If you remember, these were like bookends that we talked about last week, that in, in 12.2, this reminder that we are not to be conformed to this age, to this world. And so I get in my own mind now, I, I take that and I say, yes, Lord, I am not conformed to this age. I'm not going to give in to the way of thinking of the world. Um, but we are transformed by the renewing of our minds in Christ Jesus. So I live in that, that this age, this world in which we live, it, uh, I am not conformed to that. We go on down to verse 21, and then there is this also this other imperative. We are, we are not overcome by evil, but we overcome evil with good. And so I am not conformed to this age nor am I going to be overcome by evil. If I am in Christ, then it is an impossibility for me to be, to be conformed to this world and to be overcome by this evil age. If I am in Christ and I'm a new creature in Him and I'm serving in the new way of the Spirit, then, then there's no way. In fact, I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. I can overcome evil with good. And so keeping this in mind, all together, our lives, our testimonies to Jesus and his salvation. That's really where, where he ended in chapter 12, is that we are to show, we're not only supposed to show the, the Jews who have an improper understanding we're not only supposed to show them, as we talked about, yeah, that was at the, the end of chapter um, 11, but we are also to be a testimony to all peoples. And so that they see, oh, this is what salvation is like. This is what the new way of the Spirit is like. 
And so our lives are testimonies to Jesus and, and his salvation. Now, now, where do we go from here? So we, we come to verse 1 of chapter 13. And I want us to remember, kind of get a little bit of the context again. This is Paul's letter. He's writing to the church. Churches in Rome. And so Rome, that is the, the capital, the epicenter of, of the world right then. And so there is it's a cosmopolitan place, people from every tribe, every nation, they're all gathered there. And, and we look at Rome, and oftentimes we think about Rome as, as, the, um, as the oppressor, the persecutor. And we see Rome in, through the eyes of, of Nero. And so at the time of this writing of, of this letter to Rome, Nero probably would have been in power. And Nero was a very much a, a kind of a schizophrenic, um, uh, narcissistic. We could go through a lot of different names for Nero, a cruel uh, individual. And, and so a lot of what his personality, it carried down throughout throughout the government, throughout the empire. And so here are Christians, here are churches that are here in this environment. And there's obviously a disconnect between the life of Christ and how we are to serve in the new way of the Spirit and the life of the one that is in authority, which is Nero. And so how does one in this setting, how do we relate, how do they relate to the government in Rome? And, and so we can obviously think the negatives, but, um, but I want us to think about it, these words and remember, remember that our lives are living sacrifice. We have already given up our lives. We've given up our rights. Uh, we're to be renewed in our mind so that our mind is like Christ. And so I want us to approach these verses from that mindset. Because sometimes we really think that our government today in the United States is so corrupt and, and there are some, we, we choose sides, there's division, and, and oftentimes we don't know exactly how to respond. We respond anyway, and often, oftentimes incorrectly. And so let's go and let's take this for what it is. And so he starts out with, with this, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Okay, so uh, that is applied to the church in Rome. I believe that because of some of the, the time-tested truths that are presented here in this passage, that, that this also applies to us today here in the United States. So let every person be subject to the governing authorities. And so let's look and let's look and see and ask the question, what is God's role in governing authorities? I know our government says let's separate church and state, but let's see what is God's rule? What is his law here? And so first we see that, that, that governing authorities are instituted by God. This is God's design. It's his idea to institute the governing authorities. Um, rulers are appointed by God. And you say, no, we just had our election. We, are the, pe we the people, are the ones who appoint leaders. And, and what God is saying is that, no, ultimately, I appoint these leaders. And so we get this in our mind that, remember, we don't know God's ways, and his ways are a mystery to us, but we trust him and we believe in him and so also we see that the, the rulers of our, our current rulers are God's servants. And he, and he says this two different times. Servant is the same word that where we get for deacon, you know, or maybe the word deacon we get is this same word that, uh, that, that is used here for servant. And so this is God's servant. It's also referred to as God's avenger. And I know for those Younger folks, you think about the, uh, the Avengers movies and the heroes and we're avenging wrongdoing. But it says that this is God's avenger. This is also they're referred to as ministers of God. And, and later down in, um, uh, 
in verse 6 where it says, For because of this you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God. It's different from the servant, but it is one similar to what would have been like the priesthood who were ministers or administers of the sacrifices and the offerings. And so we're seeing that the authorities are ministers of God. And so as we look through this, does any of that make you feel uncomfortable of God's role in governing authorities? Does it make us uncomfortable that God is the one who, who institutes, appoints? These are God's servants. These are God's avengers. And that God uses these authorities for his good, for his glory. And really, he uses these authorities for our good. And so I hope that maybe that does make you uncomfortable and you take the time to process this truth. Because sometimes I think that we don't like to give God all the authority that he really, he demands and deserves. Because this kind of fights against our own individualistic, selfish ideas. And so let's take this and let's see that, no, this is what God's word says. That he is the one that, that institutes appoints, makes his servants, his ministers, and he uses people that aren't necessarily his followers. He uses the nations, he uses wicked nations, he uses, he uses good kings, he uses bad kings. He uses presidents that, that say all sorts of stuff. He uses presidents that, that we see, ah, their character is not really one that I would follow. He uses local government leaders. And, and all in all, I want us to remember as we go through this that our devotion is to God through Jesus Christ. That is where our loyalty lies. So if our loyalty lies with God, then we listen to what God says and we will see that there's a great deal of freedom when we do this. So what are, so if this is God's role in the governing authorities, what are the people's role in response to God's, God's uh, uh, role in the governing authorities? What are, what, what, what's, what are the people's role as we look down through the scripture? And we can go down and we can see that, okay, first of all, we're to be subject let every person be subject to be in, in submission, in subjection to the governing authorities. And already our pride is hurting, isn't it? We were to be in submission to the governing authorities. And why is that? Because there's no authority except from God. And those that exist, those governing authorities have been instituted by God. And so he says that, so we are to be in subjection, to subject ourselves, but also we are not to resist the authorities. Because he says, if we are resisting the authorities, we're resisting God because God is the one who put them in place. And so before you come up with all sorts of arguments or justifications, let's take it just for what it is. And let's look at the authorities the way God has said. We do not resist the authorities. So what the authorities say, what the, the laws of the land are passed down, we don't fight against it. So let's take it for that right now. He says there in verse 2, Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. So we'll incur judgment from who? We will, if we resist the authority, what happens if we resist the authorities today? If we resist the police officers, if we resist, there's judgment. We'll be arrested, we we'll, may go to jail, no matter, you know, depending on what happens. So, so they will incur judgment, but also if God has appointed these, then we put ourselves under the judgment of God. And there is that, that, uh, that grieving of the spirit that can take place when we go against what God has positioned and appointed. So remember that as a follower of Jesus Christ, I have a great responsibility in submission to God and not resisting God's authority. But just as God has appointed the rulers, I live in submission to the rulers of the land and also I do not resist the authorities. But so if we do not resist them, what do we do? We do what is good. And so our role in response to God's positioning of authorities is 
we do what is good. And so he says there in verse three, then do what is good and you will receive the approval of the governing authorities. So you'll re re receive the approval of those that are in authority for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So we are to do good. So there's no fear when we're doing what is good. We have the ruler's approval. Do you sense that? That sometimes we live in these days, we live in fear. And, and if you know that there's someone maybe who have grown up on the wrong side of the law, uh, maybe it seems like that's just the way it's always been. Then when they see somebody in a position of authority, they're fearful of it because there has been a history of doing what is wrong. But if we do good, if we abide by the law, if we respect our governor, if we respect our president, we respect those that, are, that God has put in authority, then, then we want to do good. And when we do good, we receive the approval of those. And, and so, but also we see him go down and and similar to what we said and be subject, we are also to be in subjection, to avoid God's wrath and to have a clear conscience. And so he says in, in verse five, therefore one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. So we are, we are to be in subjection to our earthly rulers. It says, because in doing so, we avoid God's wrath and, and also for the sake of conscience. So I can have a clear conscience when I, when I obey the rules, when I obey the traffic laws. I have a clear conscience when I'm not downgrading or degrading our, our president or our other governmental leaders. I have a clear conscience. I act and behave in a way that is clear before God and before people. And that is what we are to do. Because I think some, well, we'll get to all that in just a minute. So, so, but also we are to, how do we respond to the, the people that God has put in positions of authority? We carry out the guidelines that are handed down. And so he uses this example. So for because of this, because we want to avoid God's wrath, and because we want to have a clear conscience, then we pay our taxes, pay to all that is owed to them. So we, we, we pay and we give what we owe because we are a part of this country, a part of this county. We give what we owe because we are in subjection to God. And so what do we do? We pay up to all that is owed in there in verse seven. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. I will tell you, I've been guilty in times past of not respecting and honoring people in political positions because I disagreed with them because I felt maybe they were lying or maybe they were didn't have my best interest at heart. And that is something that I have to take up before the Lord and confess. And here I recognize that God is putting them in position. Now, now you say, but oh, but how can you say that? I mean, we have people in, that, are, that are in positions of power that want to, you know, they want to legalize, well, they've legalized abortion. They want to take away, they want to change all the gender rules. They want to, you know, force us into some sort of, of socialism. They want to do this. They want to bully us. They want to you know, put people out, keep strangers out, uh, your refugees out of our country. How can you say all these things? How, how do we carry out the guidelines that are handed down? How do we honor and respect these people? And I think that's where we go back to what we we're talking about at the beginning, that I serve now, not according to the letter of the law, but I serve in the new way of the spirit, the spirit of God that I am truly a living sacrifice. I've handed over my life to God. God knows the hearts of the people better than I do. He said there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. There, we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. 
I wouldn't be sitting here right now if it wasn't because of God's grace that I could sit here and talk to you. And so we are not to be conformed to this age. We're not to take on all of the disrespect and the, the dishonor that is shown in our world. But I believe that as we seek to honor God for who He is, that He is going to give us a heart to live at peace in this land and to show honor, show respect, pay taxes, pay revenue to who it's due, do whatever we need to do because we live in this land, we do good. And, and so, you know, who, who is going to really uh, be against us if we're doing what is good in this land, in this time? And so, so how do we respond in our day? We believe God. We trust that He is the one who has appointed those in leadership. We believe Him. If He says it, we believe it. How do we respond? And I'm just going to be specific in a time where there's still not been a, a certified uh, uh, vote result, election result in our presidential election. And we still have sides that are, are uh, filing lawsuits. There are sides that are saying, we must have, we, we are winning. You have, you know, there is fraud. We still have sides that that are gloating and saying, no, it's our turn now. You know, give us what we deserve. Give us the information that we deserve in this position. You know, there's all of this mess that goes on. And how do we respond in this day and time? You know what? Here, here is just what I see. That we subject ourselves to the governing authorities. We subject ourselves to, to the rule of law in, that has been set forth in our country. We, we honor and we show respect to those that are in leadership. And, and we put our trust in God and we trust what God has designed here in our country. And I want you to run this thought through. What is the worst that can happen to you? What is the worst that can happen to any of us if somebody that we did not vote for gets in power? And maybe there's somebody that didn't even run that they are trying to exercise power and do a hostile takeover. What if we lived in a country where there's a dictatorship? What if we lived in Paul's day and we were in Rome and Nero and later on in years, he, the, the rumor is that he started the fire that burned Rome and then he accused Christians of setting the fire and burning Rome and there started just a really intense time of persecution and death for Christians. What do we do in those days? I believe that we, by faith, we come to God's word and we trust him. And we do good. We do good. We obey the laws. We, we live at peace with people. And I know we could get into all sorts of scenarios to say, what about if they are... Or the government is passing down a law that uh, that violates my conscience, or or if I am have to choose between obeying God's laws or the laws of people, what do I do? Here's my going to be my answer for you, because no matter what, we never will get to the end of the scenarios. The answer is that we go back, we serve in the new way of the Spirit, no matter what that costs. We go back and we. And we live our lives as a living sacrifice before God. We've already died. Our flesh has already been put to death. So what if somebody else puts our flesh to death? They cannot hurt us because we are with him and he is with us. Think about what did he tell us to do? And we'll see here in just a moment that we exercise a great love for one another for one another in the body, but also for our enemy. And I, I believe that that may be why Paul, back at the end of chapter 12, why he says in verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. He says, you know, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Oh, he takes us down, doesn't he? He takes out our pride, doesn't he? Because we belong to Christ now. We have nothing to stand on in and of ourselves. And we go on. Repay no one evil for evil. 
but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. I believe we take this and, and we go on. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. He says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so what do we do in an evil age in which we live? Remember, this is nothing new. We do exactly what he says. And if you say, but I don't have the strength to do that, then I would suggest that, that you beg God for the strength. You let go and you go back and do what he says at the beginning of chapter 12 and present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your worship. This is your spiritual worship right here. And so he announces all those things because we need this mind. We need the mind of Christ when we go and we are presented to this, this idea of being subject to the governing authorities. Was Jesus subject to the governing authorities of his day? You know, Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus, the man, was he subject to the governing authorities in his day? He most certainly was. I mean, he was led unjustly. He, he was unjustly accused. So even the Jewish authorities, he respected them. The Roman authorities with Pilate, he spoke the truth. He never backed down from speaking the truth, but he was in subjection. He went to the cross. He was crucified. He was killed brutally. And if anybody had any reason to, to take charge and to take over and to be bitter and to curse, Jesus did. But he did not do that. Did the Apostle Paul, who wrote these words, was he subject to the governing authorities? He was. Later in his years, he, the only way he could get to Rome and make his appeal with the gospel in Rome is to go in chains. The only way that he could, he could appear before the emperor was to go in chains. And he did it for the sake of the gospel. Now I want us to see here, just a moment before we leave this idea about subjecting ourselves to government authorities, I want us to see how powerful God is in using the governing authorities of Paul's day, of that first century, of really that the first and second and third centuries, I want us to see what happened. And I want us to see how, if we remember that God's desire is to spread his fame, his name throughout all the peoples. He uses, he uses the Jewish people, remember, he used his people Israel, and even in their disobedience and their hardened heart, he used them to show the rest of the world what sin is. And so when the rest of the world comes to know Jesus and know true salvation, what is he doing? He's making his people jealous and he wants to graft them back in. There's a remnant and he desires to do that. But he is using all the nations, all the peoples of the world. So God's desire is for the truth of Jesus to spread and to spread and to spread. And how does he do that? He does it through us. He puts us in a place, in a position among wicked governments, among sinful people, and he spreads his good news. How did this happen with Rome? I want us to think about this for just a moment and think about Rome. Rome was not for God. It was a polytheistic um, nation that engaged in emperor worship um, that, that really glorified the human body and it was in direct violation with all of God's laws. But God used Rome. Let's see what happened as we look back in history you know, and we ask, can God use a ruler like Nero? Can he use rulers, emperors in those days? And so think about this. Rome controlled one of the largest empires in the world in that day and time. They controlled it. Um, they passed a law that went throughout called the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. And that extended into all these other barbaric, uncivilized countries. And so you have 
order that is brought to places where there was not order. And there was peace that allowed people to go freely over 250,000 miles of good roads. The Roman road system. What this road system did was it allowed ease of travel. It also allowed Rome to, to govern. It also allowed messages and, and, and the word to spread. And so it was kind of like the Pony Express that we know from our own country's west. We know that, that in that day and time, the Roman road allowed the word, the, the written word and message to be sent very rapidly and effectively in a protected manner. And so think about this. Also then, what Rome did, they took over and they conquered Greece. But in doing so, the Greek language, which was common then, was used all over the empire. And so you had a common language on a fantastic road system where people could travel in peace and it covered the majority of the then known world. And so on top of that also, there is this understanding of because of Rome's conquering and dispersing and, and, and how they overtook, there were Jews who were dispersed. The diaspora of the Jews, the impact of people being drawn to God. You had all these people who were not Jews. Now there are Jews in positions, in places where they never would have chosen. But yet out of that, there were the nations who saw Israel. And they saw who this, this one God is. And there were groups of people who were referred to as God-fearers. Kind of like the, the Roman centurion Cornelius that Peter, God told, God told Cornelius to go and find Peter. God told Peter to go. This is a Gentile. He's a God-fearer. Go to him and proclaim the gospel. And so you have an open door for the gospel. And so think about all of these factors that that if, you know, in light of this, God can use a wicked nation like Rome. He can use a wicked emperor. But in doing so, he used it for his purpose to scatter his word to all places. What was Paul's last desire? He says, I want to go to Spain. I want to get over there. I want to go to Rome. I want to go. I don't want to build on any other person's foundation but I just, I want to go and proclaim Christ to where it has not been heard. You know what? Under Rome, he had the freedom to do that. God had positioned countries. Now, I want you to think about our own nation. And we always go back to our freedoms that we have. But I want you to know that when Rome became totally free, when it became a Christian nation, and when it took the church out of the, out of the underground, and position it in buildings. When Rome under Constantine, when he when he declared it to be a Christian nation, then that is when the the progression of the gospel took a huge slowdown. It took a huge downturn, and I want us to think about that very seriously. That here in the United States, do not despise what we see as wickedness. Instead, let's always look to God and say, God, you are sovereign and you can use the most wicked to scatter us, to take your word and to take it where it needs to go. And so whether you are Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Independent, I don't know what it is, whatever you are, let us look to see with anticipation about how God is going to use those whom he has appointed. And in the meantime, let us see how he wants us to live. And so he says in verse 8 of chapter 13, so we, we hear this, we know that we are, we are to be subject to the governing authorities. We're to have this mindset that, that blows our mind away where we see, oh God, I trust you no matter what. No matter, let's, let's say, I'm just going to use for instance, if you are a Trump supporter, and you're really upset that Biden is coming into office. If you're a Biden supporter, you're saying, yay, 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 we finally get our turn again. And, and so there can be animosity that builds up for us against one another. What if we say, let's look not to one another. Let's not necessarily look to our presidents. Let's look to God. And let's say, God, I trust you. 
I'm a living sacrifice before you. It is not my will that I want, but I want to know your will, God. And I trust you, God, that you're going to work this out. Help me to see your work in this president. Help me to see how I need to engage in my world because of what you have provided now. If, if say, let's say president, the president in January is Joe Biden and he is saying that there's going to be this big reset and there's going to be this shutdown of all things because of COVID. And many of us are saying, we are so done with COVID. But instead of saying that, let's look to God and then let's say, God, show me how you want me to be, how to serve in the new way of the Spirit during this season. And you know what? I bet God has a great purpose for whatever that is. Do you see the understanding? It's not that we're caving. It's not that we're giving in. Remember, we don't have anything to build upon in and of ourselves, only Christ. And you know what? No dictator, no ruler can touch Jesus. You just can't. You can't beat him. And so if I'm aligned with Jesus, then, then, then we are winning today. And so let's go on down now. In light of this, who Jesus is and where I stand for, in verse 8 of 13, owe no one anything except to love each other. For, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And so again, all of this speaks of the human heart that is prone to, dis, to, to division. And here he's going back that, that we should love one another with his love. It fulfills the law. You, 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 people who have a Jewish background, don't you know that, that, that this common bond that we share in Christ with one another, it fulfills everything? So for the commandments, and he says, you should not commit adultery, you should not murder, you should not steal, you should not covet. And in any other commandment, they're all summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling the law. And so he's saying, no matter what you feel, how you think, what your side is, you must love one another. Church, we must love one another. No matter how we feel about one another, we take it before the Lord and we look at them through his eyes and we say, yes, Lord, Jesus, you are the summation of the law. You fulfilled all things. I love you. I receive your love. And now I'm going to love those around me. And then he says, verse 11, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. Oh, you know, there's a, in our culture, there are people who say that they live in a woke manner, meaning that, that now their eyes are open to all the atrocities that go on in the human nature and with prejudice and racism and with whatever else. And they claim that they are now woke and they're calling other people, you are still asleep and you need to wake up. And there's this derogatory dialogue going back and forth over this. Well, you know what? This originated more with God and this idea that maybe as followers of Jesus, maybe we have been asleep. Maybe when Jesus said, I want you to watch and pray, we were like Peter, James, and John who went soundly to sleep there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Maybe we are today, right now, sleeping in terms of God's purpose for us and the church. We think that we are awake to the days and the seasons and the time that we're living in. We know all the news. We know all the... And we claim to know all of the, the end of the story and, and all of what's going to happen before Jesus comes. And, and we, can, we can argue a debate about what's right and what's wrong in our land, but we are still asleep spiritually. We are not serving in the new way of the Spirit that dwells within us. And he says, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we had first believed. Our salvation is coming. Jesus is coming again. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, here he says it, so then let us cast off the works of darkness 
and put on the armor of light. So what are the works of darkness that we are to cast off? I think two things. We can go back and look and see that the works of darkness are all the, the evil that we do. And it is maybe our resistance to subjecting to the government that God has appointed. Maybe it's that we do not respect and honor those who are in positions to deserve honor and respect. Okay, so keeping that context there, maybe we are not loving our neighbor as ourself. But then he goes on. So that is what he's been talking about. Now he says, let us walk properly as in the daytime not in orgies, in drunkenness, not in sexual immorality, in sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. So he is saying that, and then he says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So it is time to wake up. The, the works of darkness, let's cast those off. I believe those works of darkness are anything that falls under what he says for the flesh and its desires. So we do not need to make provision for our flesh and its desires. And that is all of these things, in including orgies, drunkenness, sexual immorality, sensuality, quarreling, jealousy, all these things that describe someone who is not of Christ. But when we have put on Christ now, we make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is how we are to behave. When we behave in this way, then we do what is good. We do what is right. It's pleasing to the Lord. We live in a way that, that, that really is the best for our culture and our society. And we are good citizens of the kingdom, but also in this temporary government that we are a part of, we are to be good citizens. And so if you have questions about this and and if you want to run through all of the scenarios about how we have got to stand strong against our government and we've got to stand for our rights, my prayer is that first you will go through and see upon which rock do you stand. Because if you want to stand against a government and you're standing, the rock on which you stand is our Constitution, is our rights as a U.S. citizen, as our rights as a human being then all of those things are going to crumble and you're going to fall. But if you want to stand on something, let's stand on the truth of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, he is the rock on which we stand. He is the one that is the stumbling block, the stumbling rock that causes others to fall. We stand on Jesus. And if the government takes our life, is that really the worst that can happen to us? I know we don't like to think those thoughts, but we really do. I think Paul is talking to us and telling us we really must put our hope and trust in God through Jesus Christ. Let's trust him together and let's let him lead us in these days to come. Let's be the church that lives honorably among in our land, not compromising the gospel, but not also not seeking our own. Let's be the church that really shows the world who Jesus is. And so, church, Walnut Valley Baptist, and others who are listening in, let me pray for you that we would be faithful to the one who has called us. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us your truth. Help us to stand strong on the truth that is ours in Christ. I pray that you will help us, God, as we do not want to be conformed to this world, but Father, we want to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Father, we pray that you will help us as we seek not to be overcome by, the, by evil, but God, help us to overcome evil with good. And Lord, teach us how to walk in this way of the Spirit, how to treat others the way that you would want us to treat them and that we would look and we would see your hand at work in all of our world events and all of our life's activities, God. We want to see your truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy Spirit, help us 